wanted to thank everybody, um, and I think following Sean's lead, I wanted to throw one question out, and then we'll get some questions from the audience um, and let the panelists respond. Um, I wanted to follow up on, on something that I think um, was a theme in each of your presentations and, and the earlier panel as well, which is this call for specificity. Um, and I agree that specificity is, is um, really needed, um, but I wanted to follow up and, and open this up by asking, um, who should develop that specificity? Should it happen on the international level or on the national level? Um, so I agree so with, with Graham with your presentation. The European Court of Human Rights really seemed to sort of throw up its hands and, and sort of abdicate a supervisory role by relying on the margin of appreciation to say, sure, copyright can infringe on freedom of expression, but you know the sanctions here were sort of within the margin that um, is appropriate for states to take on, and so we're not going to um, delve too deeply into the balance that states um, individually um, might uh, adopt in trying, to uh, in trying to weigh the various um, things that are at issue, because there are really some some hard questions here, um, as, as Rebecca noted. Um, they're not it's, it's, uh, not only freedom of expression versus copyright, but also uh, hate speech, which nations can have varying uh, 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 degrees of uh, differing approaches to. Um, it's uh, all sorts. It's, it's all sorts of um, uh, in interests that are at stake. Um, so then I guess, uh, uh, um, uh, Antonia, your principles, are these principles that are to be adopted at the international or the national level? Um, and then, uh, uh, Nicola, from, from your perspective, looking at both domestic and international cases, where should this happen? Where does the activity need to happen? Because I think what I take a little bit from Rebecca's presentation is that if we leave it to states, um, uh, you know, they, maybe they're not going to do such a good job. On the other hand, there are some questions about the um, legitimacy and ability of international institutions to really fill this gap. If they do take evolutionary leaps in the law, um, they may not be, nobody might listen to them, um, or they may be challenged as undemocratic. Um, as, as so, that, you know, there's a lot, I think, that we can mine there, but I wanted to throw that out as a first question. And then let me add to it by, by seeing if there are other questions in the audience so we can get a few things on the table and then let the panelists respond. So, uh, yes. Uh, hi, my name is Alberto Roberto Cerro. I'm from Chile. I just have a question on Nicola about uh, a comment that you made at the end of your presentation. Uh, Chile today is part of the priority um, watch list. And one of the issues that we have with the USTR is that the USTR assured that when we implement the, the free trade agreement that mirrors the DMCA, uh, we didn't adopt a sufficient enough mechanism of taking down from uh, That was a serious problem for us because we were trying to find a way to implement the, the free trade agreement, but at the same time, we don't feel with the uh, international obligations on human rights, particularly with the Inter-American Inter Human Rights Convention. Uh, finally, what we did, uh, was to adopt an ex ante judicial control on the request. But you suggest an ex post facto, which is quite a different. We go before to a court and then shut down. You're suggesting shut down and then go on to a court. Uh, I wonder if that is just a problem with the translation or the issue of using Latin, or you are assuring that human rights obligation may tolerate uh, an ex post facto enforcement uh, in that kind of situation. Um, I saw them, uh, Larry and Susan, and there was one in the back as well. Thanks, uh, Larry. School. Um, I just want to reflect a little bit on some of the differences between Antonio's very interesting presentation about the Article 9 prin 19 principles and the reference there in particular to property as being uh, a right that could be limited, right, that governments have a fair amount of authority to limit, uh, and Graham's reference to uh, creative rights, for lack of, you know, fit within the, the covenant and the UDHR with the focus on individuals. So I, I do think it's um, that normally the criticism that Graham described getting from the article we were with Amy, I think it was, was, uh, would come uh, as a kind of pylon to claims that sound in the right of property. That is, that's where corporations are going to make a lot of strong claims. And I think Antonio and the principals are quite right to say that if you look at those human rights systems that have a right to property, and also the national constitutional protections of the right to property, it's a very qualified right. I mean, it has lots of room for government 
restrictions and for infringements that you just don't see in other human rights contexts. And so I can understand the reasoning behind the focus in Article 19 on the right of property. Um, but there is, I'll just highlight, a, a somewhat of a lack of engagement with the creator's rights side, which is, at least at its core, I think, harder to restrict. Now, what that core is, and very, very nice to spoke to that, I would kind of help define a core that is kind of more or less immutable. I think it's very, very narrow. We, you know, even, I think you and I maybe have differences of opinion on that. But, but I think it is a little more robust, and certainly for perhaps for, for good reason, right, than, than the right of property is applied to particular corporations. So it's not surprising, I think, that you that I just want to flag that both of you are a little bit, um, I don't want to say talking past each other, but talking about different sets of rights that, think, that have different degrees of flexibility for governments to be able to restrict in the name of achieving other human rights like freedom. Hi, thank you. I'm uh, Laura from Georgetown Law School. Um, I think Mary um, sort of addressed one of the, the questions that I was going to ask Mary, but um, two questions. The first one was about the humanizing copyright concept. And, you know, I'm sympathetic to that concept, but I wonder if there's sort of a dark side to creators' rights. And three things I was thinking about there. One is what should be the scope, right? And so what is the scope of personal authority and how, autonomy? And how do you deal with points in which that initial right is going to basically in, inter, interact and negatively impact by the follow-on innovation. Um, and then the third point, I think more importantly, is that what model of creativity um, is underlying the idea of creators' rights? And I can think of two models. One model that is, um, you see a lot in, in, in patent copyright opinions is the idea of um, flash of genius and the idea that creativity is a deeply personal endeavor, but there's an alternative model that perhaps is more accurate to how creativity happens in real life, which is a sociological model of innovation, right? That we are part of communities, right? And creativity happens as our interactions um, and relations among people in those communities. And so the question would be, if we adopt that model, um, wouldn't that sort of water down how much um, you know, creative rights you want to give to an individual um, creator? Um, and um, second and quick point um, that I wanted to make for the, for the last panel is that there's a debate um, that could be very helpful to introduce here in um, patent law and also in property theory um, that actually st stays a little bit away from the idea that uh, patent law has a strict utilitarian basis and starts looking at um, social relations theory and human flourishing as a potential way to inter interpret um, intellectual property. And I think, you know, this is a longer conversation, but I think that's kind of an interesting thing to explore how human rights potentially could, could have an entryway if you start looking at intellectual property as a way to enable human flourishing. Did you have one question? Yeah, I just have a quick comment. Um, um, and it's responding to Rebecca's issue about wanting to have more integration or a broader view of integrating human rights and having human rights considerations included in, you know, talking about the difference between the State Department on one hand and USTR. Well, I was talking to someone from the Human Rights uh, Office of the State Department, and this year for the first time, they are being asked to include infringement of intellectual property, U.S. held intellectual property as um, their annual reporting on who are human rights violators. So it can go the other way too. Um, that's a, kind of a tough issue. Just a quick reply uh, to the question. I mean, um, as a next post facto uh, judicial procedure, I mean, my, my reference, the reference was with uh, a document uh, where, I mean, uh, initially uh, the, the law was in a sort of uh, um, not a real judicial review, but uh, it was uh, an, an, an authority and not a, not a, not, not a court to, to judge about the, uh, the legality of the internet uh, uh, um, disconnection. So um, this is the, 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 the reference to the ex post facto judicial review. I mean, uh, I think this occasion to, to, to add just uh, uh, a comment um, after the, the um, 
the, 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 the other presentation. I mean, uh, when we uh, talk about uh, uh, the balance between opposing rights, uh, we have probably to take in consideration also uh, the general constitutional theory on rights and liberties, uh, according to which uh, uh, the management of right uh, uh, is an um, operation with a zero, zero sum. I mean, uh, in the sense that every progress uh, in the recognition of the new rights imply a step back, in a, uh, a step back uh, for, for uh, another right. And uh, what we have seen today is that uh, intellectual property rights, uh, if we look at intellectual property rights, they grow up in the last 50 years. I mean, there was an implementation in, in terms at least of uh, um, of uh, copyright term, for example. I mean, uh, the, the, the initial copyright term of the Statute of Anne was seven years. Uh, now we have a few more, 70, after post mortem authorities. So it's evident that now we have a, a problem with the balance between uh, opposing rights. I mean, uh, human rights are more or less the same. <laughs> Uh, the freedom of expression is the cornerstone of every democratic democrat society. And uh, obviously now we, we need to rebalance the system. Well, um, yes, about the first question is, uh, all the, this, this principles that we are presenting are, are um, just guidelines of how, how how to think uh, this debate in, in, in to making policy. I mean, uh, the, 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 the best um, option to this is to tropicalize them and to localize them um, in the national law frameworks, regional uh, law frameworks, and obviously international law uh, framework. But the aim of these principles is to go um, as much um, as much on the ground as possible, because um, when we um, when we discuss uh, them uh, with uh, experts around the world and uh, studying all the cases in the courts, uh, I mean we only have a view what is the public debate about about this and what the courts are saying, what the governments are doing. Uh, what the, the uh, academic field are uh, saying or researching, and uh, that's why these principles are so uh, general. But it's a very good gut guideline, I think, to make policies better in this in this field. On the other hand, um, I don't know. Uh, yes, you you you're you're right. I mean, the the, the in the in the paper. Um, the argument is the lack of property in the intellectual and the so-called intellectual property right, because we opposed obviously the intellectual property right to the property right, and uh, we 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 um, intended to understand uh, the lack of the the word property in the so-called intellectual property right. That's why uh, we defeat the the concept of intellectual property right. copyright or trademarks or patents but not intellectual property but because if if it, if it, if the right of the intellectual property right uh, is treated like the property right then the government ha uh, will have a lot of limits to that i, I mean in the possessions like 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 operates in the property right itself so um, yes you're right about uh, your lecture on that. Um, I think our just just in terms of uh, just a, a few responses to to, to the very helpful comments. Uh, uh, Susan Sell's point. Um, yeah, there there is a potential dark side to the emphasis on uh, creators' rights or the human rightsization um, of of copyright. Um, and I think that was a comment that was um, made um, at the back back of the room. Um, the, the, my, my point is dark forces will come flooding into that space unless we engage and occupy uh, that space and start developing a normative content for the rights of uh, creators that um, might, might be a softer, less expansionist um, 
and um, avoid some of the more egregious excesses that we know are lobbied for um, um, by um, aggregators of, of content. Um, so just because this can be ma manipulated and used, I think is the, the real reason uh, why I think we need to engage with the, the content of, of those, those rights. Um, now, on, on Larry's point, I, I don't think we were talk, talking past each other. My, my simple point is uh, using the right of property and uh, the accommod accommodations and exceptions and, and uh, avenues for limitations um, uh, might, might be helpful, but it only tells part of the story. The, 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 um, the analysis will be stronger um, if there is also an engagement with the, quest with the um, questions that people want answers to, which, which is, okay, there, is also, there are also uh, statements about um, creators' rights uh, that need to be engaged with. From an activist perspective, of course, we can pick and choose. Uh, we do that all the time. You know, I, I've done you know, what works, um, you know, but from um, a, to, to render norms uh, more robust, and less susceptible to uh, withering critique, um, it's important also to deal with the, 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 the whole uh, jurisprudence um, in, in the area. Um, I think Molly, Molly raises a, a terrific, terrific point about where uh, norms should be uh, developed. And I, developed. And I'm struck by um, a lot of Rebecca's um, uh, uh, terrific presentation really concerned rule of law issues. Um, that, that a lot of what you're talking about with, with th things um, uh, like uh, transparency, accountability, uh, checks, and checks and balances. And I think in this space it's probably quite useful to disaggregate uh, rule of, those kinds of rule of law concerns which I have no issue uh, with universalizing um, and international bodies having important things to say about those kinds of questions. But I'm struck by the question about uh, uh, models of uh, creativity. Um, I, I think it's important not to be prescriptive about models of creativity that, that actually exist on the ground. They're going to differ from nation to nation, uh, from um, different, different kinds of social contexts will have different kinds of approaches, there will be, be different kinds of uh, models there. So I'm, um, in New Zealand, we say kicking for touch. I think in the United States, you say taking a punt. Um, but I, I'm going to do that on that question because I think we should resist um, uh, having prescriptive models of creativity that um, uh, cause the uh, uh, jurisprudence in this area to become rigid. I think we should um, ac accommodate um, all abilities of, of members of the human, human family to exercise their imaginations and um, provide us with the benefit of that. Last words, Rebecca? Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, that's <clears throat> very interesting what you say about the State Department. Um, and I think this speaks to, I think, one of your principles about achieving transparency and how policies as well as laws get made. Uh, and one of the concerning things, and again, this sort of falls into extra legal uh, realms, but uh, when certain interests don't get the laws passed that they want it passed, they find ways to tack on things on various other processes uh, and policies that are not that are extra legal, but end up having you know, a certain impact in terms of defining U.S. interests um, and sending messages and sending priorities in a way that has not been subject to public debate, public scrutiny. I'm not quite sure. I have no idea what the process was for having that change made in the State Department human rights reporting process. Um, you know, who asked for it, how it got approved, etc. No idea. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, that's you know, part of the problem. Yeah, you know, you can't pass the law, you get, you try and get into the trade agreement. You know, that's the, the other mechanism that is very popular. It's troubling because there's no public accountability. So please join me in thanking the panel. And